Good afternoon and welcome to this first keynote session of our Perform Live conference. It's a great pleasure for me to introduce Dr. Anu Vevelainen, who is the head of the DOCMOS Doctoral School at the Sveilis Academy, the University of the Arts Helsinki in Finland. Anu obtained a doctorate from the Sibelius Academy in 2008 on the solo piano music by the Polish modernist Karl Szymanowski. She later recorded the whole output for piano solo by Szymanowski. She performs both as soloist and chamber musician and has recently performed the whole output for violin and piano by Szymanowski with violinist Mieko Kano. From 2004 to 2014, Vefelainen was a member of the Finnish ensemble Tampere Raw, performing on a regular basis contemporary music, including several premieres of Finnish composers' works. Since 2009, Vefelainen has worked at the Doc Moz Doctoral School at the Sibelius Academy as assistant professor, professor, university lecturer, and from 2020 onwards as head of the doctoral school. Anu is the founder and the head of the steering group of the biennial Doctors in Performance Festival Conference, and I'm honoured to work with her on this steering committee. Doctors in Performance Festival Conferences have been held at the Sibelius Academy Helsinki in 2014, the Royal Irish Academy of Music in Dublin in 2016, in Vilnius in 2018, Tallinn 2021, and we are very much looking forward to the fifth event, which will be held in London next year. Anu was also elected to the board of the University of Arts Helsinki for a four-year period from 2022 to 2025. Anu Vefelainen is dedicated to promoting artist audience interpretation in her programme Open Artist and Dear Audience with workshops, seminars, lectures, and lecture recitals. Between 2015 and 2020, Anu was a member of the artistic research group, The Silence Ensemble, with dancer Kirsi Hymanen and visual artist Petri Kaverma. The group's artistic research project on silences, practicing, and transformation got funding from the Center for Artistic Research at UniArts Helsinki for the academic year 2018-19 during which they developed their own collaborative artistic research method. During a five-year period, the group gave several lectures and organised workshops and retreats in Nordic and Baltic countries. In her recent research, Vefelainen has used an auto-ethnographic approach in studying piano practising, being in the now moment, presence and space. She has also studied the pianistic orientation in Karl Szymanowski's piano music, as well as, during the pandemic, the ontology of a performance in online or Facebook music making. She has recently published an article with actor-director Juicy Letonen about the audience contact course at the Theatre Academy and the Sibelius Academy. And we are delighted to have Anu with us today to present this first keynote address for Perform Live entitled Quest for Joy in Music Making, Artistic Research on Seizing the Moment. Thank you. Thank you, Denise, for your kind words. I'm really delighted to be here. Uh, thank you, Una, for invitation. Thank you, Sandra. Thank you for the whole organizing team. It's absolutely wonderful to be here in Dublin with you. <clears throat> so this presentation is about seeking joy in music making. The Western art music tradition can make it hard for a performer to feel joy. First, there is the romantic concept of Werktreue, the performer's fidelity towards the musical work, which in its most rigorous sense may obscure the performer's active role as an interpreter. Actually, do we even need the performer in the first place? As Richard Taruskin puts it, instead of attending an opera performance, Johannes Brahms stayed at home. Reading the score gave him a more satisfactory experience of a musical work than a live performance. Hence, if we allow the performer to perform, 
he or she should absolutely be a transparent medium. Otherwise, the composer's intention may not be transmitted to the audience. So how am I supposed to feel joy as a performer if I need to worry about not transmitting the composer's intention? Several years ago, reading Lydia Goer's writing on the work concept and its status in art music tradition was an eye-opening experience for me as someone having devoted my life to practicing and improving as a musician. The canonization of great masterpieces started at the end of 18th century, found its full strength during the Romantic era, and is still going strong in 2022. It is hard not to see the musical work of an art music composer to be the most important part of an art music concert. <clears throat> but as we know, and as we have heard here in this event, composers are usually much more flexible than Brahms, who refuse to see the opera performance. Like Stravinsky, again according to Taruskin, was frustrated about performance free interpretations, but as soon as he took the baton in his own hands, he started to interpret his own notation as any performer or conductor would do. As a composer, Stravinsky had specific expectations towards the performers, but as a performer, he rejected those expectations immediately. Also, according to Taruskin, Claude Debussy and Elliot Carter were open to different interpretations of different performers. Even if the hierarchy between the composer and the performer is not as strict as it was in the Romantic era, the dichotomy still clearly exists because these are two different professions, whereas in the 18th century, a musician quite often practiced both activities. Hopefully the gap between these two will narrow a bit more in future. For instance, within doctoral education at the Sibelius Academy, there are several performers who have used improvisation as an important tool in developing their artisthood. As far as I see, to feel joy as a performer requires that a performer studies closely her relationship with the musical work and the composer, whether the latter is Beethoven or someone who lives and breathes. Artistic research is a way to narrow the hierarchical gap between composer and composers and performers. It makes performers thinking and tacit knowledge loud and visible and shows the contribution performers can offer to the art music culture. In my quest for joy, I now focus on two other concepts, which I see essential in art music tradition, artist and artisthood. <clears throat> Pianist and eth ethnomusicologist Henry Kingsbury argues that in the Western art music concerts, the performer is obliged to show required technical skills and offer the audience authentic and intimate interpretations about sacred musical texts. A solo recital is some sort of a ritual. Through a particular scheme, the performer is isolated from the audience with emotionally charged and sacred social distance. Performers themselves have also stressed the religious vocabulary when talking about music making. Pianist Eero Heinonen says that art goes higher than people. Researcher Maria Lisa Saarela, who has studied culture and narratives, argues that Heinonen's thinking represents prophetic narrative, in which an artist is someone whose duty is to convey the highest musical message. Also, there are many allusions which separate artisthood from, let's say, mundane professions. Opera singer Marti Talvela, as well as pianist Daniel Barenboim, have defined artisthood to be more like a way of life than just a job. Talvela continues, art is a world of its own. It is close to a sacred man's pray praying ritual. It requires vocation. We, the artist, have been chosen." End quote. Sacred, isolated, authentic, ritual, chosen. As a young music student, I hardly ever reflected the different ideas I had internalized about artisthood 
since my time was dedicated solely to practicing. But of course, implicitly, I had absorbed ideas all the time without questioning them. The art music education is mostly about learning to handle the instrument, technique and style, and getting to know the essential repertoire. The art music education is not about reflecting the ontology of artisthood, questioning romantic or other peculiar concepts, or crashing down harmful hierarchies. Should we find time for that? Should we add some new courses to the musician's curriculum, simply open forums to discuss about how it feels to be an artist? I continue my quest for joy. As a Finn, I ask, what kind of foundation does the Finnish mentality offer to musicians? As you might know, I hope you know, for the fourth time in a row, the World Happiness Report ranks Finland to be the happiest country in the world. So let's hear the lyrics of the famous Finnish Christmas carol. <clears throat> hey elves, jump around a bit. Very short is our life, gloomy and sad. <laughs> For your information, this is one of the happy Finnish Christmas carols. <laughs> Professor of Finnish history Juha Siltala argues that the great Lutheran revivalist movement, the awakening during the 19th century in Finland, explains the way anxiety is dealt with the Finnish mentality. Siltala studies the influence of the movement from the psychoanalytical perspective. He juxtaposes a mentally broken individual who is seeking for a redemption from a religious movement and a psychoanalytical idea of an unfulfilled child-parent relationship. In both cases, the individual is lost and confused. In psychoanalytical therapy, an individual persona can be strengthened in a way that different threats um, from the outside world will not destabilize the persona anymore. During the 19th century, psychoanalytical therapy was not available for people looking for a solid self. Hence, the salvation was offered by the awakening movement, Siltala argues. Siltala's qualitative study is built on the psychoanalytical development theory that starts from an axiom of child symbiotic unity with the mother, which then progresses towards the relative independence and freedom. Siltala argues that what happened during the revivalist movement several decades ago in Finland molded the Finnish mentality in such a way that it still has consequences. The awakening movement in Finland began in the Savo region and spread to the Ostrobotnia. Later its influence expanded beyond these areas. While industry and cities were growing in Finland in the 19th century, agriculture could no longer guarantee living for the younger generation. The poor people living in a hunger limit became aware of the need to fight for their individual destiny, perdition or salvation, which was introduced to them with religious language and imagery. Whereas before the right for being was offered to a person as a member of a community, like family, class or congregation, the changes in the society made people seek for this redemption individually. For an individual, this was, uh, this was psychologically demanding, and the outcome of this confusion was expressed through remarkable experiences all around Finland. <clears throat> there were people in trance-like religious scenes, speaking in languages, experiencing horrors or connection to God. The individual, having no longer a strong communal identity, was breaking down. Siltala argues that while people suffered from hunger, wars, epidemic diseases, and sudden deaths, deaths, mothers were unable to dedicate themselves to their children and fulfill their needs, whereas fathers couldn't offer a positive identifying object which would lead the children to separate themselves in a healthy way from their mothers. The ideal psychoanalytical development happens only in ideal circumstances. When life is really hard, the mental self-image has not received enough of building material. 
the insuffice and child-parent relationship force people to seek for a solid mental personality elsewhere, that is from the awakening movement. The most influential preachers of the awakening, like Paavo Ruotsalainen, asked the followers to confess the sins and wait for help from God. Man couldn't contribute towards the salvation since that was only an act of God. God was great, whereas the human being was small and sinful. Surrendering completely to God had to be constant. It was a daily struggle and nothing ever was enough. Along with internal struggling, the movement emphasized simple and quiet life with no extravagant expression. The clothes and hairstyle were simple and modest. Dancing, theater, or music making were not desirable. <clears throat> According to Siltala, the Finnish mentality owes a lot to this severe and colorless movement. Today, 69% of Finnish people are members of the Lutheran Church, which is not as pietist as and strict as the awakening movement was. But nevertheless, according to a survey which was taken in 2010 by church labor unions, 48% of the Finnish Lutheran priests recognize in their thinking the influence of the awakening movement. <clears throat> The joy seems to escape even further. I find odd similarities in my rigorous and merciless piano practice and the devotion the awakening movement demanded from its members. As I mentioned before, during my bachelor and master's studies, I never had time to reflect anything since I was practicing all the time. After my master's, I spent a couple of years teaching in music institutions, but soon applied to artistic doctoral studies at the Civilis Academy. That was the starting point for change. I began my project on Karol Szymanowski's piano music, altogether five recitals assessed by an artistic board, plus a thesis on Szymanowski's style, works, and historical context. After the second doctoral concert, I hit the mighty wall of the Western art music tradition. The artistic board commented my playing in the feedback session. They said my playing was well practiced and controlled, but maybe I would like to let go a bit and play in a more courageous way. I was annoyed. Days after the feedback session, I still thought about those words. I decided to throw away the thesis I had written on Szymanowski and started a completely different research project. During one year, I kept a work diary and let myself write on whatever I wanted. I noticed that I had absolutely no urge to talk about piano music, but instead I wrote about social psychological aspects of the art music life. I started to notice hierarchies. I began to question my relationship with the musical work. I asked what an artist means and why I don't dare to call myself that. Most of all, I finally looked at the way I had practiced the piano. I had spent years in a practicing room and finally got out to see what it made me. A quote for my thesis. Why am I not an extrovert seizing the moment, always being worried about what happens next? I don't take risks at the grocery store. Why should I do it on stage? It has been weeks after my doctoral concert and I keep thinking, yeah, I'm not spontaneous. I can't just powder spontaneity onto my playing like salt. The suggestion of letting go and taking a risk is huge, is groundbreaking for me. Again, another suggestion which I try to internalize slowly, clumsily, using my very heavy apparatus of cognition, focusing again on details and using most preferably a lot of time. I'm trying to seize the moment thinking about it first for a month." End quote. <laughs> six to eight hours per day. One colleague once said that if I don't practice every day, it feels like not having taken a shower. <clears throat> For me, practicing was staying alive. I felt safe at the piano. Like people of the awakening movement, 
seeking for salvation from God, I sought my salvation from the Western art, art music gods, which were high above me, a simple and modest human being. Another quote. I'm not fast, energetic, nor spontaneous. I never feel that I've practiced enough. Instead of seeking for an end result, I recheck and recheck details." End quote. Remember how the awakening demanded to surrender completely and constantly to God. It was a daily struggle where nothing ever was enough. Quote, During my bachelor studies, my practicing was slow and painstaking. I forced myself to put every single part of the material under the microscope. Every chord, motive, phrase, and trill were separated from the context and scrutinized carefully in different ways, using accents, dotted rhythms, playing in forte with a lot of strength to get a big sound, etc. After having concentrated in a D minor chord for a while, I moved to a C minor chord starting all over again, as if the D minor had taught me anything." End quote. So my doctoral thesis was a lot about looking back and reflecting on my practicing habits. I graduated as a doctor in 2008 and started the recording project on the total output of Shimanovsky's piano music. The five albums were released between 2010 and 17, which means that I have spent approximately 20 years with Shimanovsky's music because there was the doctoral degree before that. Hence, the music of the great Polish modernist has molded my musicianship the most. Playing Szymanowski's pieces felt that I'm carrying a universe on my shoulders. Szymanowski's output begins with works influenced by Chopin and Skrabin to the extravagant late romanticism through a highly personal Mediterranean and expressive style, and finally a period with the closeness to the folk music of Tatra mountaineers. Typical to all his work is density. Here I reminisce how I feel as I think about Szymanowski's music. I don't play it, I think about it. This is from an article I wrote two years ago. Quote, when I look at a Szymanowski score or think about playing his works, I'm in a readiness state. I don't dare to approach this music lightly. I cannot think about it casually. I don't smile. I'm not feeling playful. Instead, I'm reservedly concentrated and really tired thinking about the huge amount of work ahead. I curl to a mental bubble of the keyboard, the score, and the music stand, my hands and my head. Mostly the head. It is ready for the upcoming task, ready not to get alarmed. My head is full, no room for anything else. Not another bar written by Karol Szymanowski. And as my strength is canalized to my head, I forget the rest of my body. End quote. My artistic approach, which is very head-oriented, is challenged by many artists' researchers. Cellist Elizabeth Leguin introduces many bodily sensations, glancing, sitting instead of standing, putting her instrument between her legs, the neck of the cello position on the left side, the bow on the right side, uh, sorry, the bow on the right hand, etc. Through Boccherini's cello, uh, cello sonata, she descri describes the embodied feelings of that music. Pianist Satu Paavola classifies her fingers, joints, palms, and arms as the playing technique varies. Pianist Tina Karakorbi goes even further. She identifies her lungs, abdominals, back, fingertips, feet, hips, everything. Instead of sensing my whole body, Shimanoski forced me to inhabit only in my conscious, cognition, thoughts. <clears throat> At the end of the year 2015, dancer Kirsi Heimonen invited me and visual artist Petri Kaverma to study the concept of silence. The foundation of the research of the Silence Ensemble was built in eight interdisciplinary sessions during the spring 2016. I was playing the piano, 
Kirsi was dancing and Betty drawing and shooting videos. We let things happen without theoretical presumptions or research question. The thing we did decide was a time frame. 15 minutes of silence, 40 minutes of praxis, playing, moving and drawing, then writing notes and finally discussion. <clears throat> this is a setting where three different praxis were happening at the same space shocked me completely. As soon as I tried to play some Shimanovsky pieces, I realized that someone that is Kirsi is moving behind my back. Instead of going to the head-oriented mental bubble, I noticed that I have back in the first place and behind it someone is moving. These perceptions, which were strongly tied to the physical reality, messed my playing experience completely. I faced an ontological dilemma. What am I doing? Certainly not practicing, since I practice alone, not with somebody moving behind me. Neither is this performing, since when performing happens, people are staring at me. Kirsi was not staring at me. She was busy moving and concentrating on her own stuff. During the spring of 2016, we met once every three weeks, eight times altogether, 90 minutes per session. During that time, several things happened. A dancer movements made me move as well. First, I played musical works as an educated classical musician, but then I felt the need to take over the physical space. I started to move around the room, touch the objects like chairs and tables, I used my feet as well as my eyes. I actually looked at the grand piano from a distance and noticed that it looked so much smaller when I'm, than when I'm playing it. The experience was very physical, spatial. I'm here, I'm with these people and with these objects. Kirsi, Petri, floor, ceiling, walls and chairs. Here and now. No future, no past only this moment. In the, uh, in the sixth session, the unexpected happened. I started to improvise for the first time of my life. At the beginning of the project, I had announced that I will never improvise in, since that doesn't interest me and I wanted to be myself, a classical pianist playing composed musical works. But something in the safe atmosphere of our collaboration let me to improvise for a whole 15 minutes. It felt amazing. I didn't think about how good or bad it sounds. I only focused on the now moment, without plans on comparison to the past. Walking around the classroom, touching and looking closely at objects and improvising at the piano was finally a chance to seize the moment. When I wasn't worrying about what happens next or what had just happened, I felt joy. The Silence Ensemble, Kirsi, Petri and myself, continued the experimental research for five years. We developed collaborative artistic research methods and continued to study the presence also with breathing exercises. Personally, I studied the now moment both in practicing alone and in live concert situation where the st uh, stage fright wants to take control. Being present and being in the now moment is actually beneficial to every life situation because that pushes the constant worrying away and gives room for joy. Feel your breath, feel your body. You are here now in this moment. Now I will show you in practice how we can together seize the moment. I will play a recital of miniatures by a Finnish composer Mikko Kervinen. Kervinen writes, quote, These pieces are very short, only a few seconds long. Still, they are independent entities, not fragments or parts of bigger works. First, I composed miniatures to be performed as a collection. Then I came across the idea of composing individual, separately titled pieces. If a musician wants to perform even only one such a miniature in a concert, it would be allowed, and in fact, appropriate, since the idea is to concentrate the composition into one moment. Beware, 
when a pianist stops playing, that particular piece is really performed in its entity, end quote.
honest account of your development through your music education and your career as a practicing musician. Mm -hmm. And it was very moving in parts, so thank you very much. Okay. Um, I have to say I found the connection between the personality or the characteristics of a nation to the quest for joy in music making really fascinating. I'd love mm -hmm. to see somebody do something like this in an Irish context mm -hmm. and see what would be discovered. Uh, would anybody like to ask a question or make a comment? Mary. Thank you very much. I thought it was a wonderful, wonderful presentation, a very thoughtful talking. I have kind of a convoluted question. Um, first of all, I was really interested in your choice of repertoire. I really enjoyed the performance. And the fact that the pieces themselves were kind of in the moment, mm. you know, um, and also the improvisational quality of them. Mm. Um, and yet, there was a score, and you could hear that the effectiveness of the performance was a lot to do with detail and precision mm. and all of that. And yet, it did have that kind of improvisational quality. So my question is, could you bring the same quality, or do you, or do you think you do, to performing Szymanowski, for example? Or is it perhaps easier to be more courageous, spontaneous, mm. take risks, let go, all those words you got for the feedback? in contemporary music. Thank you so much, that is a very spot on comment. Um, of course, if we think about control and difficult textures, you have to have certain control if you mm. want to have, a, you know, master the whole texture and the, the whole piece, etc. There are difficulties, but still I would say that no matter what the music is, I, I always try to be in the moment. Sometimes it's more difficult, sometimes it's, uh, it's less difficult. And mm, when I take back the Shimano's pieces I've played before, uh, it is possible to practice this very thing, even though I have internalized it in a certain way. Mm -hmm. But I feel that this finding the now moment is so important to me that I, I think it, it comes first in anything I play. But you are right about the, the material. The difficulty in Gervinen's pieces is that they are so short. You can't just wait for the, the good moment because the piece is over <laughs> if it's just way too long. So it has to be in the very first second. But uh, in that kind of music with a lot of fermatas and like not very accurate rhythmic writing, it, of course it, it is more liberal. I, so, my my answer is somehow uh, it, it has two uh, meanings at the same time. Um, yes, it would be possible to look for exactly the same kind of freedom in Szymanowski's pieces as well, but it might be more difficult as well. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks, Sue. Now, when you sent me your, your PowerPoint presentation and went through it, I noticed that a lot of it was retrospective worries mm -hmm. about performances or worrying in advance. How much do, the, in the actual moment, does performance nerves play or has played in your past? Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. As opposed to? Actually, I wrote an article or an exposition, which is uh, on the internet, uh, like an open access exposition. Um, about the concert that I really practiced. It was after the Silence Ensemble project that I found this thing and I wanted to practice in, I wanted to practice it in practice. And uh, there was a concert with a violinist. And I had this moment that I, I'm going to the dark side again. The audience is coming right away. But then I, I, I seized the moment and I, I thought that, okay, now I can do something if I want to. I can concentrate, I can calm myself. I think that, okay, I have, I have practiced enough. That's enough already. I can enjoy this moment. Really somehow reflected and work on that, these dark thoughts, which are very familiar to me. Yeah. I think all of us are suffering. I, I know one person who doesn't suffer from stage fright, but please announce yourself if you are. There are more <laughs> than. So of course we do, but I think the, the point is to, to share these ideas. 
uh, to share and talk a lot about this already when we are kids and learning music. So it's uh, a lot about the pedagogy. And of course, I, I, I know this was kind of black and white because they were my own thoughts and my experiences, but I know the pedagogy has developed a great deal uh, in later decades. And, and um, for instance, I, I, uh, one music teacher, uh, when she organizes a concert with the kids and the kids are hearing their friends playing, then the, the teacher is asking, uh, what do you think about the melody maybe? What do you think of the, the other person? What do you think about the rhythm? So the, the small children are capable in their own terms to uh, reflect what is to be an artist, what is to be on stage and all that. It's the same thing for the kids and when we grow up it's more complicated but the, the same uh, themes are there already. So. And thank you so much. That was just so fascinating. It's, uh, my question is sort of a corollary to Mary's. Um, you know, if, when you're performing, say, Chopin or Masterworks, as, as they are known, um, do you feel a huge weight of responsibility on your shoulders when, when, when you play pieces like that? Because, of course, they would be so much more easily criticized than, uh, you know, what you yes. play today. I have a short answer, yes. yes. <laughs> when I chose my topic to, uh, to make a doctor decree, um, actually I didn't know how, how difficult tomography was, but it was somehow, of course it was a big task, but at the same time there wasn't this um, tradition of playing Shimonovsky that much. If I had chosen Beethoven and Chopin, it would have been different. Uh, somehow I find it safe to, to work with that, because uh, m many pianists don't really know the, the, the rhythm, so, so it's a uh, it's different thing. I think we, as a community, as musicians, we need to work with this weight. We all understand what the repertoire means and how we want to be bigger, uh, like um, truthful to the words and do the best we can do. But at the same time, we should find the, find the freedom and even whatever piece that is to just forget everything and be in the moment. These are very complex issues, I know, but we can try. And I was really happy yesterday because I, I was thinking about the quest of joy and then we had this lovely performance yesterday with Diana. Uh, Diana Daly. Daly, yes. And uh, the other one also was awesome. the, the audience was uh, participating in the improvisation, which was fantastic. It was obvious. I was thinking about the people in black clothes, these uh, creatures in my <laughs> slideshow, and then these kind of performers we had here yesterday. So a big contrast. Yes, I was thinking about that a lot actually during the perform or during the presentation. That contrast between the presentation yesterday yeah. and what your experiences. Yeah. Music. Yeah. Yeah.
Thank you um, so much. Like Denise, I also find that a really moving presentation. Um, it's clear that that feedback that you got um, was fundamental in, in kind of making you kind of think about things. I'm just wondering though, I mean, everyone now, and I think it's a good thing, thinks very carefully about the feedback that you get. Reflecting on it, is there a way that that panel could have given you feedback that would have been more positive? Yeah, again, that was my interpretation of the feedback. If you have heard it, maybe you had heard because of what we always hear the bad things. <laughs> <laughs> feedback is like 10 positive things, and the one thing you said, it, I, I was annoyed. But uh, yeah, certainly the feedback, giving feedback is one of the, the most difficult issues. It's not easy for anybody because we want to help when we give feedback, but then again, it's, we need to be honest as well. <laughs> I'm really grateful for that feedback because it was it was really essential and uh, yeah but took a while to really I'm really still learning it every moment if I go to to play piano I need to remember it but don't just uh, do your job but try to enjoy every moment <laughs> I think it's very difficult. Okay, so important and it's something that's not really discussed even with very young beginners. Mm -hmm. See children and there isn't much joy in a lot of their music lessons. There's much joy in their practice. Mm. And I think it's something that we should be taking on board is that children should be finding joy in what they're doing in their music. Mm. But it's not encouraged or it's not taught. And in some cases, it's actively discouraged. You're right. Yeah. I was really shocked recently. One of my doctoral students told me as a child she was blocked in a practice room for 12 hours by her teacher. Oh, my God. And, you know, this is. This is fairly recent. Yeah. Um, not in Ireland, I guess, in Thailand. But there isn't any joy in that. Mm. You know, how do you find joy in being locked into a room for 12 hours by your teacher and told to mm. practice? I think mean, it's just mind boggling. Yeah. yeah. So that's why I think it's really important to hear what you have to say today and to think about how we can incorporate these kinds of things into our training and teaching. Mm. Thank you very much. We have another question. Hello. Thank you, Miranda. Absolutely wonderful. Thank you. Um, the question I have is that you know, different musical traditions have different value sets. Mm. And for many traditions, including Western art music, a core value is excellence. Mm. And when we talk about something like being in the moment, very often those traditions require us to abandon values, you know, that, that if something emerges, it emerges, but we must we must abandon a goal. So I think my question is, is there a fundamental tension between the value of excellence and being in the now? <laughs> that is very well put. I, I think you answered your question already. <laughs> there is a tension between those two. So that is a very good um, um, point. I need to think about it more. Not an easy question, but thank you thank for the comment. Okay, we'll take one final question. Uh, hi, thank you so much, that was amazing. Um, I was just wondering, because you mentioned the huge difference between practicing by yourself and then being working with other people mm. in the room. Um, I was just wondering then if you have like a conception of the audience when you're performing versus when you're practicing, is there, you know, when you're performing to be in the moment, is the audience sort of irrelevant or just an extra pressure or is there a different kind of, is Absolutely. there a different kind of joy possible in connecting with an audience as you perform than if you audience are playing by yourself? Yeah, thank you for, uh, I think audience is very relevant. If I try to be in my bubble, I try to, um, describe the mental bubble I was in, and that was the world, music, musical world I was working. And uh, you know, if you are in that bubble on stage, it's it's not a good thing. And in this exposition I wrote, an article I wrote about this, the same issue. Uh, it was really the audience that helped. Actually, we arranged that concert so that the violinist and myself we were sitting on stage before the audience came in, and then, and I also write, wrote to the uh, program notes that. We would like to be in silence and 
uh, without the applauses between the pieces, let's try to have a, the whole entity of the concert, like 60 minutes together, and let's be quiet. And people respected that they came in one by one, and I could see the faces, okay, he, he came and she came, and we were sitting there, and then we were silent, and then we had the concert, and it felt really good. And I, that was the, maybe the, the best uh, first part ever experiencing the concert, and it was about uh, interaction, really. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank yeah, you. There was a lot to think about, Anu. Um, Thank you. So it was a very, very enjoyable presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you.